if I'm pressed to describe MMT in a sentence, like give me the sound bite, MMT is about replacing an artificial, fake, phony, imaginary budget constraint with a real resource constraint, an inflation constraint. So is there a limit? Yes. Is it the limit that almost everyone wants us to believe? That is that the government can run out of money, like Obama said, become like Greece, have bills you can't afford to pay, go broke and bankrupt the nation and so forth. No, I will go on Fox and CNBC and so forth. I will never let anyone put me in a position where I have to concede a faulty premise. So if somebody says to me, well, how are we going to deal with the debt problem? What are we going to do about the deficit? I never say, well, if we grow the economy, we can bring down the debt to GDP. I never concede a false premise. And that's the problem that too many left and progressive economists even make is reinforcing those bad frames. Flip the script on them. Let's talk. You want to talk about deficits? Let's talk about the deficit in healthcare or education or housing. Let's talk about those deficits, right? This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard professor of economics and best-selling author of The Deficit Myth, Stephanie Kelton. And in a moment, we're going to be hearing Stephanie in conversation with Gabrielle Bond and Dr. Stephen Hale of the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group at an online event which took place on the 24th of February, 2021. In the show notes, I've linked to where you can support the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group financially, and their website is also where you can sign up for email alerts about upcoming events and courses, and where you can watch video of this event. The conversation is, as you'd expect, a perfect run-through of the fundamentals of MMT and its policy implications, followed by audience questions. In the interview, you'll hear Stephanie recommend an article by British economist Wynne Godley entitled Curried EMU. And to save you from searching for that and coming up with a bunch of actual curried emu recipes, I've linked to that piece in the show notes, along with Stephen's recommended read by Godley entitled Maastricht and all that. Stephanie also talks about Pavlina Chernova's outstanding work on the MMT job guarantee. And I've linked to our episode 47 with Professor Chernova laying out the job guarantee, along with all of our other episodes with Stephen Hale, all of which are essential listening, in my completely unbiased opinion. Towards the end of the interview, Gabrielle mentions the summer school being run by the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group, and I've linked to where you can sign up for that, and also to a list of other online events and courses, just in case Adelaide happens to be inconveniently located on the other side of the planet from you. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 72 British pence at the time of recording. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all our episodes and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT and huge thanks to Gabrielle, Stephen and the rest of the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group for organizing this event. We start with opening remarks from Gabrielle. Let's dive in. My name is Gabrielle Bond and I help run the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group in Adelaide along with Stephen Hale. It's great to have everyone here today. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the important role played by First Nations people all around the world in the fight for climate justice. And I will hand over to Stephen. Thanks very much, Gabrielle. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Gabrielle and the volunteers at the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group for organising this event. Um, the Australian Greens, and specifically David Shoebridge, member of the Legislative Council in New South Wales, 
and our own Tammy Franks, member of the Legislative Council here in South Australia, for suggesting it and promoting it, and the School of Economics at the University of Adelaide for supporting it. There have been so many other groups that have been involved too. I hope people will forgive me for not mentioning everybody uh, on the list. I perhaps also ought to also uh, mention Democrats abroad who've been very helpful. Our guest, Stephanie Kelton, is Professor of Public Policy and Economics at Stony Brook University on Long Island near New York. For the benefit of any economists listening, she first came to my attention as the author of two papers which are among the foundation stones of modern monetary theory. One was entitled Do Taxes and Bonds Finance Government Spending, which was in the Journal of Economic Issues. The other um, was The Role of the State and the Hierarchy of Money, which was in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Um, you sometimes see people online suggest that there are not many modern monetary theory papers in peer-reviewed journals. That's not right. That just means they've been reading the wrong journals. If you'd like a reading list, anybody, if you are an economist, then just write to me and I'd be happy to send you one. Uh, subsequently, Stephanie was head of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and editor of the New Economic Perspectives website. In recent years, she has been a chief economist on the Senate Budget Committee, in, obviously in Washington, D.C., advised Senator Bernie Sanders across two presidential campaigns, being a fellow of the Sanders Institute and holder of visiting professorships at the New School for Social Research in New York and the University of Ljubljana. Prospect magazine named Stephanie one of the 50 most influential thinkers in the world and Politico as one of the 50 people most influencing the policy debate in America. She was in the Bloomberg 50 for 2019 and in Barron's 100 Women in Finance for 2020. Best of all, from my point of view, she was the 2020 visiting uh, Jeffrey Harcourt Professor at the University of Adelaide. As you almost certainly know, Stephanie is also the author of The Deficit Myth, which is a New York Times bestseller, the number one selling book in the world on economics last year, and is having a huge impact on policy debates globally. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephanie. My pleasure. Um, thank you. That was uh, a bit over overdone, but thank you for that very kind introduction. And it is so nice to be back with the two of you, Gabby and Stephen. Uh, I, you know, I was with you in January of uh, last year, right? I mean, it's hard to believe that it was it was just last year that I was there in Adelaide with you all and with probably many of the people who are, are joining tonight. So I'm really happy to be with you. I, I'm trying to pick up my second win because I've done a lot of events today and it's uh, getting late here, but I'm going to um, I'm going to be as animated as I can, and <laughs> I look forward to getting into these these questions that, you know, Stephen's going to take us through. So thank you for, you know, everything that you have done, you too, and I know a number of others to help uh, push the ideas forward there in Australia and to support the book and, you know, all of our work and advance. Uh, really, I think what's what's happening is that we're we're having a lot of success. We are changing the nature of the policy debate and it's it couldn't come at a more important moment in time. So let's dive in and thank you so much. Um, well, that's, that's perfectly okay. Uh, a big part of changing the policy debate has been the book. Um, writing academic papers is one thing. Writing a, a book which leads so many people to question things they've always taken for granted about economics is another thing entirely. What inspired you to take the project on in the first place? Well, it's about right, it's, you know, it's writing for a different audience and mm -hmm. communicating with other economists is really what you're doing largely when you're writing articles and publishing in peer-reviewed journals. They, the, to, to be frank, they don't get read by all that many people. And even the most popular articles uh, and influential articles are mostly read by other economists. And yes, you can influence the policy debate that way, but I really wanted to empower just ordinary people, you know, that we are bombarded on a daily basis. Everyone here uh, who's joining tonight knows that, you know, the, the public discourse is so broken 
that when you have the president of the United States, as we had with uh, President Obama, literally going before the nation and getting a question about where all the money is coming from to deal with, you know, supporting the economy after the last crisis, after the financial crisis. And at what point do we run out of money? And when the president of the United States says we're out of money now, right? And when the discussion is so broken that we're wringing our hands about deficits and what we can afford and we're drawing the wrong lessons from the experience, you know, what's unfolding in uh, in Europe, in Greece, and and so forth. I just wanted to, you know, put the ideas forward in the most accessible way that I could, um, and try to get them out there and into the hands of a broader population, so that people can be empowered to both engage in the debates. Because sometimes it feels overwhelming, like you know, these are lofty economic arguments and. Ordinary people can't possibly, um, you know, take on a Nobel Prize winning economist or a senator or a president, you know, or journalist when they say something. Um, but to give them uh, an, a set of arguments that they can use to fight back against some of the broken thinking. And so that's what I wanted to do with the book. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the political debate over here in Australia at the moment is between uh, three. Uh, parties really, one of which has pivoted towards austerity already. Um, the second party, the main opposition party, uh, is talking about for every dollar it spends, for every extra dollar it spends in one area of public policy, um, finding a dollar of saving somewhere else. And the third party is talking about taxing billionaires more in order to raise money to pay for uh, investments in education and healthcare. What's wrong with that narrative? What are they missing? Well, they're, the f fundamental thing they're missing, I think, is chapter one of the book, <laughs> right? Yeah. Chapter one, I call, um, I say, don't think of a household. That's, that's the title of the chapter. So I'm trying to set us off on like getting off to a good start, putting, you know, getting the right foot forward. And so getting the right foot forward in this context means recognizing that the, that the government is just fundamentally different from the rest of us, that governments issue the currency and the rest of us are users of the currency. So the currency issuer can operate its budget different from a household, right? It doesn't have to quote unquote, find the money in order to be able to spend. So this idea that, you know, deficits are inherently irresponsible, that good stewardship of the public finances means matching up uh, how much you take in and how much you spend, that if you want to spend that dollar more, then it's got to come from somewhere. You've got to carve it out of some other part of the budget, as you said, or you've got to find new revenue. And so that's broken thinking, right? That is thinking of the government as having constraints, as having a budget constraint that's sort of akin to what households face, instead of recognizing that governments are nothing like households, and the main thing that distinguishes them is that they get to issue the currency. They literally get to spend the money into existence. And so we have to think about the limits very differently and how the government can operate its budget. So the three uh, scenarios that you just laid out there are all reflective of broken thinking. None of that shows an appreciation for what makes the government different from businesses or from households. It's so strange, really, that, that that is the narrative when you come to think of it that uh, in Australia, and it's, it's even more true in the US, the government budget has nearly always been in deficit. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Unfortunately, you know, I think it's not as old as me. <laughs> I'm th I think, you know, it's funny, um, this is a little off topic, but I do notice this weird thing that, uh, you know, there will be an article written about me that will include my age. I never see that really happen with men, with no. men economists. I don't see the, the age included there, but it, it always happens with me. So I'm not going to tell you, but it's all, it's all over the place. But the point is that I think for four years of my entire lifetime, the U.S. government's budget has not been in deficit. 
right? Four years uh, that that the government has either balanced the budget or, or had a budget surplus. And that's what you're saying, right? Deficits are the norm. It is normal for the federal government's budget to register a fiscal deficit. Nothing inherently problematic, unusual. It's a perfectly normal thing to, uh, to have happen. It's been that way almost my entire lifetime and without the sort of you know, fallout, the negative consequences that everybody warns about, you know, increasing deficits or persistent budget deficits result in increasing the national debt. And at some point, you know, the narratives are always that this leads to Armageddon, that there's, there's, there's fallout from this. It's just, it's just not true. It's not borne out by the history, but the story just hangs around, you know. Well, it's such an attractive story to tell. I suppose it's so easy for them to tell during the um, heat of an election campaign. You, you never seem to be put under pressure as a result of being too much of a hawk as far as fiscal policy. Yeah, right. I mean, you sound like the grown up in the room when you stand up and give a speech and pound your fist and fire and brimstone about how you vote for me because the last party um, you know, left us with these huge, the, notice the language they often use, blew a hole in the budget, mm. drowning in red ink, you know, charging the national credit card, driving us into debt. They always use that really inflammatory language. So you stand up and you come in sounding like the sober um, statesman. You say, you know, the, the last party did all of these things that put us in danger, we're at risk because of the way the finances were managed in the past. Vote for me and I will put the budget right. I will, you know, protect us from becoming like Greece or, you know, some event where China turns off the spigot and no more dollars come out. And then we're in real trouble sort of thing. And, you know, to the extent that people don't know better, it sounds reasonable. It sounds responsible. It sounds like the kind of thing you want to get behind, right? So you scare people and then you tell them to vote for you because you're the person who will keep them out of danger, out of harm's way. So what, what should a responsible fiscal policy look like? So the, the key thing is to avoid thinking at all, really, about the number that falls out of the budget box at the end of every year. That is largely irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter whether the government's budget ends the fiscal year with a small surplus, a small deficit, a large deficit, a large surplus, a balanced budget. The right fiscal outcome is the one that balances broader conditions in the economy. So if you can achieve a good economy, if you can, uh, you know, carry out an agenda that allows you to create a good economy, you know, high levels of employment, good paying jobs, low inflation, poverty rates are coming down, your infrastructure is being maintained. If, if the things that matter are um, being realized, right, you're delivering on good outcomes in the economy, and it takes a deficit that's 5% of GDP to get there, so what? You have low inflation, full employment, high wages, low poverty, right? You're, you, what difference does it make? If you can get there with a 2% surplus, okay, fine, right? That, that is the point, that the budget outcome isn't what we should pay attention to. You're not trying to balance the budget. You're trying to balance your economy. And you, you want to stay laser focused on those objectives, right? The things that matter. And then let the number go where it needs to go. It's like, you know, I have an oven in my house. I don't choose to, you know, cook dinner at 300 degrees because last night I cooked dinner at 375. And I say, mm -hmm. well, I, I can't, I have to lower the temperature tonight because I used all the BTUs that are available or something, you know. Um, you you can start fresh each year and and readjust things to just try to maintain a good economy. So we say that every dollar the government spends is a new dollar, the government being the, the currency issuer. Every dollar the government spends is a deposit the government's making somewhere in the monetary system, in the, in the banking system. And the government doesn't have to raise taxes in order to go and um, engage in additional spending. What's the tax system there for? 
Well, you're, you could get me into a, a long monologue with that question, Stephen, as you know. Um, you know, there's an origin story. There's a way to talk about the role of taxes from the beginning. Like if you wanted to start a currency from scratch, the tax or something that works like a tax is important because you're trying to get people to work and accept your currency and to provide you with the stuff that you're after. So if you want a military, if you want infrastructure, you want hospitals and roads and bridges and a standing army and all that, governments have used taxes or fees and fines, other things, to move those real resources from the private domain into the public domain. So it's a way to start up a currency from scratch. You say to the population, all right, everybody, uh, you're gonna owe me, you know, at the end of the month or whatever, a certain number of units of my currency and you don't have it. So everybody starts scrambling around to figure out how to earn the currency that they need in order to settle their obligation to the state. So that tax is important in that origin story. I'm doing this quickly, obviously. Uh, once you have a monetary system up and running, then taxes are important for a lot of other reasons. Like you might think, and a lot of people uh, ask this question, well, if the government can issue the currency, why bother taxing at all? Why don't you just spend and leave the rest of us alone? Like cut our taxes to zero. Everybody hates taxes. You'd be so popular, you know, if you just eliminate taxes and just spend your currency. And most people can figure out pretty quickly that you're going to run into trouble because if all you're doing is spending the currency and you're not subtracting any of it away from people by taxing it away, then you're going to very quickly undermine the value of the currency. You're going to create an inflation problem. Why would people work for something that's so readily available, right? There's too much of it. So taxes are important because taxes are for subtraction. So the, the currency is a tax credit. It's important because it takes some purchasing power away from the rest of us, and that helps to mitigate inflationary pressures. Taxes are important because government might care about things like distribution, income and wealth uh, distribution. And so you might um, think about changing the tax code, closing loopholes, introducing a new tax, raising an existing tax, cutting a tax, right? Because you're trying to disincentivize or incentivize certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. You might do it because you want to actually alter the distribution of wealth and income. You might look at what's been happening over the course of the last hundred years or so and say, my God, you know, we are allowing the inequalities to become so extreme that this is bad, not just for the way our economy works, but it's bad for the way democracy works. Wealth is too concentrated in the hands of too few. And you can, you know, make adjustments to, to taxes, um, not because you need the revenue, not because you need the money, but because you want to deal with those, you know, um, inequalities. You want, you want to address the, the concentration of wealth and ownership in the economy. So tax are important for a lot of things, but not for revenue. It's so uh, attractive to progressives to, who want a more um, progressive tax system, who want to address the distribution issue, to frame it in terms of taxing billionaires to pay for things, isn't it? It's, it it uh, is attractive. I call it, so I don't know, you've probably heard me say this, but I call it the two itch problem. Because hmm. look, Robin Hood, we, we sort of think back uh, about Robin Hood and he's sort of this hero, right? We think Robin Hood was this guy uh, who, you know, took from the rich and gave to the poor. And that's a very heroic thing. So you hear a lot of progressive politicians and others talk about um, raising taxes for the purpose of getting the money that you need, that you need. And that word is important hmm. in order to feed a hungry kid or repair a crumbling infrastructure or whatever, right? So we're gonna take from the rich and we're gonna heal our nation. We're gonna feed people and, and better fund our schools and our healthcare and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so what are the problems with that? Well, one is that's just bad economics because that's not how government finance works. So the story is wrong. The other problem from, well, two other problems from my perspective, you tend then only to go after concentrations of, of wealth in a very timid way, because you see, you say, well, I only need 10 billion or I only need 70. So I can do this with a very small 
tax on billionaires, a wealth tax, you mm. know, right? We heard this from Senator Elizabeth Warren, who I like. I'm a fan, okay? But when she talked about the wealth tax, she talked about taxing um, the very wealthy people with 50 million or more net worth, net worth, right? 50 million, 50 million dollars or more. You're free and clear on the first 50 million. But on the 50 million and first dollar, she said, we want two cents. You just chip in two pennies, right, on that next dollar. And then you keep paying 2% on your wealth above five, 50 million up until a billion. And then once you hit a billion, we want 1% more. Okay, so 3% three, on everything over a billion. And she said, you, they won't even feel it. Okay, they won't, they won't even notice it. She literally made the argument that it's such a tiny imposition on what they have that they won't even notice it because wealth tends to accumulate at a more rapid rate, right? So they're still going to become richer and richer and richer. And my reaction was, well, hang on, okay, if the purpose of the wealth tax is actually to aggressively get at concentrations of wealth, then what's the point of a little bitty old thing that nobody hardly even knows is happening, right? And the, the answer is, well, that's the way to pay for everything. So if you can do this, you just peel off just what you need so that you can claim to the Congressional Budget Office and, and play the legislative process. And you say, well, this is all I need to pay for making public colleges and universities tuition free pre-K and some student debt cancellation, which is what she wanted to do with the well tax. So I guess what I'm saying is if you're coming at this from an MMT through an MMT lens and you think about the purpose of taxes the way that I do, then you're not thinking of the taxes to pay for. It's not about paying for things. It's not about the revenue. You're using the tax to achieve a different goal, which is addressing, you know, deep concentrations of inequality. And then you could make a case for something like a wealth tax, at least in a consistent way with through an MMT lens. And you'd presumably go much higher because you're not worried about the pay for. It's not motivated by that. Yeah, we say, don't we, that federal governments in monetary systems like Australia's or in the US have no purely financial constraint on their spending, but we are not implying that there are no constraints at all. Exactly. In, in fact, that's really, in many ways, kind of the core, you're taking us right to the core of MMT. Mm. So, you know, I will sometimes say that if, if I'm pressed to describe MMT in a sentence, like give me the soundbite, uh, MMT is about replacing an artificial, fake, phony, imaginary, budget constraint with a real resource constraint, an inflation constraint. So is there a limit? Yes. Is it the limit that almost everyone wants us to believe? That is that the government can run out of money, like Obama said, become like Greece, have bills you can't afford to pay, go broke and bankrupt the nation and so forth? No, that is not the punishment for overspending. The punishment for overspending is inflation. So there is a limit. The limit is how many dollars can safely be spent into the economy before the economy runs out of capacity to meet that spending, that higher demand with more supply. And remember, you know, government spending isn't the only kind of spending you have to worry about. Government doesn't do the majority of the spending in the economy. The private sector does, specifically the household sector. They normally account for about 70% of total spending. So the government has to share spending space with everybody else who wants to spend into the economy. There's only so much space available and the government has to respect the the total limit, right? The capacity limit for the economy. So yes, there's a limit and um, we are nowhere close to it in a pandemic depressed economy with unemployment that's very elevated. But um, if you push things far enough, you will approach that limit. Hmm. We often say um, that it's just a matter of accounting that sectoral balances have to come to zero in the monetary system. And you put it in a rather more accessible way. You say their red ink is our black ink. That's one of the, that's what the title of one of the chapters of your book. Uh -huh. uh, what do you mean by that? 
Well, so you use the phrase red ink in Australia? Sure, yeah. You know, because when I was doing the book and writing the chapters, I remember asking, as I would do presentations, you know, in the UK before the book came out, and I was using, you know, the public purse and red ink and so forth, and, and that wasn't necessarily a common turn of phrase there. So, okay, so you use red ink. So, the title of the chapter, Their Red Ink is Our Black Ink. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the government deficit is just the difference between two numbers. That's literally all it is. We have this visceral reaction. We've been conditioned to, you know, hear the word government deficit and think, whoa, something bad is happening. No, nothing bad is happening. The deficit is just the difference between two numbers. So what are these numbers? The first number is how many dollars the government spends into the economy each year. And the other number is how many they subtract back out, mostly through taxation. So in the book, I stick with the same example, which is suppose the government spends $100 into the economy and it only taxes 90 away from people in the economy, taxes 90 back out. We label that a government deficit. So we write minus 10 on the government's ledger and we say, oh, they're swimming in red ink, right, this deficit. What we forget to do is pay attention to the math, which says if they put 100 in and only take 90 out, they're depositing $10, right? Their deficit is our financial surplus. Their red ink is our black ink. Their deficit is nothing more than a financial contribution. They're making a deposit into some other part of the economy. So that's why I say every deficit is good for someone. Every government deficit is good for someone because on the other side of that red ink is somebody else's surplus, financial surplus. So the question should never be, you know, sh is it, should, should the government be in deficit? The question is really, you know, deficits for whom and for what? I mean, it's just that simple. Every deficit is good for someone. You reminded me of a cartoon you used in the lecture you did here when you were the Harcourt professor of our treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, as Cupid, firing, uh, firing dollars into the private sector. And it was supposed to refer to there being an imminent budget surplus. And then oh, well, so he, confused. It, yeah, it's, it's like, the uh, wasn't there, you're going to get me, I'm tired, I'll make a bad joke or something, but you're making me think of like a 007 movie. There was something like from Russia with love or something. Yeah. Well, there's the Cupid, right? It's um, where you, our deficits come to you with love sort of thing. Yeah, it's a, I'm, I'm shooting, sometimes I say a, a deficit, a government deficit works like a blower, right? It blows financial assets onto the balance sheets of people outside the government sector. A government surplus works like a vacuum. It hoovers financial assets off of the balance sheets, off of the ledgers of people in the non-government part of the economy. So we have this idea that a government surplus, that is the real um, thing to achieve. That is the, the badge of, of fiscal uh, responsibility. If the government can achieve a surplus, man, that's showing you, you know how to run the budget. But when the government is running a surplus, it is reducing the financial assets from the rest of the economy. So it is literally like hoovering up uh, dollars from the rest of us in order to put their budget in the black everybody else has to be driven into the red. Yeah, it's weakening private sector balance sheets. It either right. drives the economy into a recession or it drives uh, the private sector further into debt, which is what, of course, happened here during the Howard government years when the government ran surpluses eight years out of ten. Unless, unless you happen to be in a situation where the rest of the world is blowing dollars onto your balance sheet. And you can do that through a current account surplus, or we could loosely call it a trade surplus. So it's not necessarily the case that a government surplus dooms the private sector because the private sector can be kept in good uh, financial shape if the rest of the world is supplying the financial assets that keep the private sector whole. But somebody somewhere else has to be running a deficit. There you go, yep. That's right. Everybody can't be in surplus at the same time. Now, when you explain all these things to people, and I often say, why would you want a government surplus unless you actually need to have one 
It means they're taking more dollars off you than they're giving to you. It doesn't sound like a, a good thing in itself. People talk about growing uh, government debt and increasing national debt. And uh, recently, a couple of times, I've had people say, our national debt in Australia is over $800 billion now. It's heading towards a trillion dollars. Isn't this going to lead to a crisis? Isn't it something we should be concerned about? Should it concern us? Well, no. I mean, again, with the MMT lens in place, what should concern you are, you know, high levels of inflation, high levels of unemployment. When I say that the goal should be a broadly balanced economy, that's what I'm talking about. I'm saying, you know, if you can get the unemployment rate down without triggering un, uh, inflation, you know, that you consider excessive and you can manage the inflationary pressure and get the economy to full employment, and we could talk about how to truly achieve full employment, mm -hmm. then no, you know, the, again, the deficit, the difference between two numbers, right? So you spend 100 in, you tax 90 out, you've deposited 10. What happens as this is occurring, is that the government is matching up its deficit spending by selling government bonds. Mm -hmm. So that $10 deposit is immediately transformed into a government bond. Let's call it a $10 government bond. So that's somebody's financial assets, part of their savings, part of their wealth. So when people look at you know, the government's finances and use language that you would use to describe a household's finances, then you start describing this as borrowing and you start using the word debt to describe what's happening. I don't look at it that way at all. I think that you know, using the word borrowing is misleading. I think the word debt is misleading when we talk about what the government is doing. Mm. If I borrow money, I borrow money because I don't have it, right? So I go to a bank, I sit down with a loan officer, I say, I'm here to borrow money. And the loan officer says, what do you want to borrow money for? And I say, I want to buy a car or start, a, you know, expand my small business or whatever. And maybe I'm granted a loan. Now I have debt. Okay. I have to repay that mm. with money that I, I got to come up with from somewhere, right? The federal government's different. When the government runs a deficit, it puts 100 in, subtracts 90, leaves $10, and then comes along and says, well, I want to sell these government bonds. Who wants to buy them? And sure enough, there's $10 that's been made available that gets turned into $10 worth of government bonds. So it's not like when I borrow, right? I didn't walk into the bank and put the money down in front of the loan officer and then ask the loan officer to lend me that money. That's what the government does. They're spending supplies the dollars that are then available to buy the government bonds. So I think the word borrowing is misleading. I think the word debt is misleading. Those bonds are just another monetary instrument. There's another thing that government issues. It's, it's interest bearing. So the government is choosing, that's a voluntary thing, right? The, a currency issuing government never has to borrow its own currency from anyone, never has to do that. This is an optional thing that they do, and it, you might think it's a nice thing. I mean, we could debate that, but you might think, oh, you get to give up your currency and hold a risk-free asset, and you get a reward, risk-free reward. Wow, that's kind of nice, right? So this is an instrument that is interest-bearing, very safe, and it provides a risk-free subsidy to the bondholder. So... Um, you can, you know, we suggest that we really should be thinking of the outstanding total stock of government securities, bonds, as just part of the broader money supply, not use that word debt to, to describe what it is. It's really just an interest bearing form of currency. Absolutely. And the, the, pros, the pros and cons of uh, issuing bonds could get us onto a, quite another long, right. long discussion. But it is a choice. Uh, yeah. Governments like the US government and the Australian government are not forced to issue treasury bonds at all. Or where there are uh, regulations or practices in place which, which encourage bond issuance at the moment, they could be changed. There's, they're not fundamental to the monetary system. 
No, they are an instrument that allows governments to support interest rates at positive levels, right? You can maintain and manage interest rates, but there are other ways to do that. Absolutely. Um, people sometimes confuse MMT, I don't know whether they deliberately or not, um, journalists, for example, with quantitative easing when it's got nothing really to do with quantitative easing. And uh, there's a, a question from a member of the public from uh, uh, Peter Holding, which uh, kind of relates to this. He says that Alan Kohler, the uh, famous financial journalist in Australia and somebody who definitely um, understands MMT thoroughly, um, called on the Reserve Bank to buy out all the government's debt and just write it off recently. Would this change anything significant and is it a worthwhile suggestion? I mean, they are buying up, they bought up an eighth of the government's debt over the last year uh, as a result. Well, the, the Fed is buying $120 billion a month, yeah. right? Um, so, so, but the thing is, when the central bank buys the bonds, the treasury is still continuing to make the payments. So mm -hmm. every government budget includes that line item that says interest on the public debt. People in the media often call it the debt burden or the debt service burden. So that language is problematic, right? Mm -hmm. When I worked in the Senate, uh, I don't know how many times I heard U.S. senators say they look at that number and they see 400 billion or 350 billion as the line item in the budget called interest expenditure, right? Interest on the debt. And they go, oh my God, we're spending, we're on track to spend more on interest than we spend on the military if you project out, you know, some number of years. And they would just, it would blow their minds. And, you know, I would, I would point out that, well, there are a couple of ways to deal with that, right? One is you don't have to issue the bonds at all. Mm -hmm. And as, as all the bonds matured, that line item would just disappear. If you don't like the number being as large as it is, you could always cap interest rates. We did it before. The Fed has done it before. The Bank of Japan is pinning the 10-year on Japanese government bonds at zero because the, the BOJ says we're going to keep it at zero. We're doing That's something similar to that here now. With oh, okay. Bonds. They're pinned at 0.1%. So, but the, I guess the point is, as long as they still sit on the balance sheet, and this gets to the question about writing them off, yeah. um, we would say, MMT economists would say, once the central bank buys the bonds, it's as if the treasury never issued them in the first place, in mm -hmm. the sense that the treasury will make the payments, the central bank remits the profits back to treasury at the end of the year. So it's like a left pocket, right pocket thing. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, that everyone still sees the line item in the budget, the interest expense, and it's still there, right? People still see it. So this question uh, is about whether there would be advantages to having it not still be there, to actually writing it off once the central bank buys it, just make it disappear from the whole you know, accounting uh, and, and dispense with the exercise where you pay the interest and you pay back the principal at maturity and then it goes, you know, um, politically, yes, there would be uh, probably advantages to doing that. We have a debt ceiling limit and the bonds that are held by the Fed are counted as part of the public debt and subject to the debt. So it's like crazy, you know? So, yeah, there are advantages to, I, I suppose, doing it that way. Mostly you end up with a negative capital position on the central bank's balance sheet, but that really doesn't matter. No, I mean, <laughs> it, there, again, it's the politics, yeah. right? You only have to deal with the politics. The economics are fine. Um, um, maybe we'll move on to uh, Luke Heffernan's question. Luke asks whether the deficit myth has got anything to say about nations without a sovereign currency? Yes. Um, uh, there's a whole chapter that yeah, deals with, uh, you know, it's the, it's the open economy or the trade chapter. And so the answer to the, the short answer, to the question is yes. And the long answer could go on for a long time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the answer is yes. It I don't explains, know how much It explains want. why countries like Greece or Italy can get into difficulties as far as uh, financing fiscal deficits are concerned. 
Um, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the the point is to to emphasize that countries that have a particular set of arrangements mm. that, you know, the country has a monetary system in place where the government issues the currency, the currency is uh, a floating exchange rate where the government doesn't promise to convert its currency into something it could run out of. So you're not on a gold standard where you're promising to convert your currency on demand into gold. You're not on a fixed exchange rate where you know, you're know you Russia in the mid 90s and you promise to convert rubles into dollars at a fixed mm-hmm. price. You're, you're on a floating fiat currency system. You're the issuer of the currency. You're not borrowing in currencies that you don't control. So you're, if you're um, you know, the US, you're not borrowing in foreign currencies. If you're um, Argentina or Russia and you start borrowing Venezuela, you start borrowing in US dollars heavily, then you're talking about a totally different animal, right? And the constraints on government finance are different. You're mentioning Greece and countries that um, are part of the EMU, those countries gave up their sovereign currencies. They gave them up, they abandoned them, Mm -hmm. and they adopted a a common currency, the euro, which these individual countries cannot issue. So there are different constraints. We all saw that play out in 2010 when the debt crisis gripped countries like Greece and Portugal, Italy, Spain, uh, Ireland. and, And so we know what can happen when a country has debt that it literally can't afford to service, right? It's got to go out and it's got to borrow the currency because it doesn't issue it. It goes to capital markets. Capital markets are lending to governments that don't issue the currency. So they perceive rightly that there is default risk involved, that this country might not be able to pay you back. So they want a premium to compensate them for the added risk associated with lending to currency issuing governments. And at one point, you know, in the 2010 era, interest rates just completely blew out and you had a full-blown debt crisis. Notice that that didn't happen in the UK, didn't happen to Japan, it didn't happen to the US, it didn't happen to Australia. You know, we are all operating, our governments operate with a sovereign currency. We can manage our interest rates. We don't have to borrow in the first place. Borrowing is optional. Yeah, Greece doesn't have that option. And it's it's worth pointing out that your one-time colleague, Wynne Godley, warned the architects of the Eurozone about the potential for a crisis like this in in the early 90s when they were opening the system up? I was so fortunate, as were some of the other MMT economists, to to meet and work alongside Wynne. And he actually, you know, served on my doctoral dissertation committee. And, you know, truth be told, he he kind of was my dissertation advisor in in all but name. Um, Wynne was brilliant, a British economist who um, spent many years as really forecasting Mm -hmm. the British economy. And I think, you know, has earned a reputation of of being just about the best there ever was in terms of, you know, his ability to accurately see where, where things were headed, you know, well ahead of the rest of the pack. So you're quite right. The euro was introduced in January of 1999, officially became a, a currency. But, you know, people understood for years ahead of that, that this was the direction that many European countries were heading. And, you know, the Maastricht Treaty and the, um, you know, uh, um, I don't know what to call them, the laws that were shaping up were leading in that direction. And as early as 1992, when was writing and saying, "Uh uh-oh, you folks are, you're putting in place a blueprint that is going to lead to trouble down the road because you're proposing to do something that uh, really hasn't been done before, in a sense. You are divorcing monetary policy and fiscal policy in a way that is going to leave you vulnerable to economic downturns and unable to act when a crisis comes and you're not going to be able to use fiscal policy and you're going to have face debt crises and all this. And when could you see it plain as day? It was so crystal clear to him that when you give up your currency, you're giving up a lot more than just the ability to depreciate your currency to try to improve the, you know, terms of trade and, and so forth that you were really compromising 
your ability to stabilize your economy in times of crisis. And he meant specifically fiscal policy. So Wynne Wynn had it all figured out as early as 1992. And because I was working with him um, you know, in the late 90s, but before the euro became official uh, currency, I, I was lucky enough to be influenced by his thinking and to not fall into the crowd that was cheerleading this um, you know, currency arrangement, because I could see what he saw, which was basically a design flaw in the blueprint. Yeah, and I, I recommend anyone who hasn't read it, uh, look up Wynne Godley's article, Maastricht and all that. Um, which we also had one, one called Curry EMU. Curried EMU. The first one was Maastricht. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. both of them are terrific. Yeah, yeah they, absolutely they are. Well, I mustn't uh, finish our conversation finish our conversation before asking you about the job guarantee. There's renewed discussion of a job guarantee in the US. I've got the resolution of uh, Congresswoman oh. Anna Presley in front of me, which looks as though it's very much inspired by modern monetary theory. Um, you've been one of the main advocates alongside uh, Pavlina Cheneva and in Australia, Professor William Mitchell as well, of a federal job guarantee for many years. Would you care to explain why it would be such a progressive measure? Yeah, I mean, so we have this incredible member of Congress, and you just mentioned her, Congresswoman uh, Ayanna Presley, and she just in the past, you know, few days, I think Friday of last week, if I'm not mistaken, uh, formally introduced a, a resolution in Congress. Now that's different from a bill; it's mm. it's not a formal piece of legislation. Or, I mean, a, a, a bill, but it is a resolution, mm. and she is getting it on the table. And she has come out in favor of a federally funded basically a public option in the labor market, right? A federal job guarantee where anyone who wants to work, wants a job and cannot find one anywhere else in the economy has a right, right? To a good paying job, right? A, a, a job that pays, well, we can debate $15 an hour, but a living wage job and benefits. So a wage and benefit package that you always have as an alternative to unemployment. Mm. So, you know, I saw today and I, I was pretty busy and I didn't really get a chance to watch the whole thing, but I saw that the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King mm. was retweeting and sharing a video that Congresswoman uh, Presley put out where in her own words, you know, she's laying out the answer to your question, which is what makes this such a progressive policy. And so for people who maybe haven't seen that yet, you know, go find her Twitter feed and watch this incredible video. I think it's about three minutes long, um, but it's that arc of history, you know, that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about that, that bends toward justice. And this resolution is her effort to bend that arc toward justice so that, you know, people who have nothing, who have no entry point in, no way to support themselves, no way to, to get a job and, and to survive, uh, always have the security of knowing that whatever else happens in their lives, you know, you have a right at the end of the day to a job that pays a decent wage and comes with benefits. And that's a very different answer than, you know, the kind of answer that a, you know, buttoned up economist might give about the benefits of a program like this, just, you know, in terms of efficiency, um, making the labor market more liquid, uh, allowing workers to transition in and out of this program as some way of um, better stabilizing the economic system, which it has those benefits as well. But there's also really important human and moral side of um, the job guarantee. And that's, that's certainly what uh, Congresswoman Presley is leading with. And it's what we're campaigning for, including our Sustainable Prosperity Action Group here in Absolutely. Australia and Greens and members of the Labour Party right the way across the country uh, as well. And yeah. uh, Stephanie covers uh, the federal job guarantee um, proposal and its role as a, a counter-cyclical stabiliser in modern monetary theory in her book. And I also recommend Pavlina Sheneva's book, The Case for a Job Guarantee, which is a great read as well and uh, goes into some of these issues in, 
in a lot more detail too. Oh yeah, the, probably almost any question that you you or the people joining would have about how the program would work and the benefits you will find in her book. And she also has a website where she um, has created a nice FAQ of frequently yeah. asked questions. Mm -hmm. And that, that is just really sharp because just any question that pops into your head, I'll bet you uh, she's got it there and, and she's got an answer to it. So, And Pavlina was involved in a successful job guarantee style scheme in Argentina in the mid-2000s, wasn't she? Which uh, they should never have uh, removed, actually. <laughs> she left it in place. Yeah, Pav Pavlina and uh, Matt Forstatter, mm -hmm. who is a fellow MMT economist and a professor at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Um, I think both of them worked with uh, someone in the Argentinian government in the uh, Ministry of Labor yeah. to design and implement a, a version of a job guarantee program that was for that was extremely meaningful and successful to people who were able to take advantage of it while it existed. Yeah, I recommend reading about Plan Heffers uh, in the book. Yeah. I might end my um, section of uh, the event this evening just by asking another question from a member of the public, from Neil Halliday. He points out that our central bank governor, Philip Lowe, recently said at a national press club event, we don't do MMT in Australia. Uh, was he right? And how can we change his mind? How can we change his attitude? Well, okay, so on Valentine's Day, I tweeted, you know, everybody does this every Valentine's Day, the roses are red, violets are blue, and then yeah. you finish this, this uh, <laughs> phrase. I think I tweeted, roses are red, violets are blue, MMT is a lens, not something you do. So, you know, is he right? No, um, because if he's under the impression that MMT is something you do and he's not doing it, then he already is revealing that he doesn't understand what MMT actually is. It's a description. And I hate to break the news, but we're providing an accurate description of what he actually does, right? What the central bank does, the mechanics of government finance, how the monetary system works and the mechanics of government finance. And we're just trying to tell the truth to people about the nature of it all and how it works. And, you know, central bankers like to be shrouded in this sort of veil of, you know, secrecy. And it's all supposed to be sort of mysterious and we don't do that and we don't. Uh, but frankly, we're, we're just telling the people how it works. So, yeah, he's mistaken. And they really should know better because his deputy was at a talk you gave in, in Sydney last year, Guy de Bell. <laughs> yeah, you said that. I mean, I think I sat next to him and we probably had some small talk. And I think if I remember correctly, maybe he asked one question at the end of some remarks that I gave, but um, I don't know how much of an effort he's made to actually engage with any of the scholarship. So. Well, he may be next in line to be the governor, so <laughs> maybe we'll see. Thanks very much, Stephanie. I'll, I'll hand over to Gabrielle now. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of great questions coming through from the chat, but um, if you don't mind, I'd like to um, just bring David Shoebridge into the meeting, which I'll have to do by... Uh, finding him in the list and giving him uh, co-host permission. So if you don't mind, I'll just quickly do that because he's got a question that he'd like to put to us. This event was really David's idea. Oh, thanks, Gab, and thanks for doing um, all of the hard work behind the scenes, often not celebrated enough. Stephanie, um, I'm really grateful for you taking the time out. I'm, I'm sure you've got global demands, and, and I particularly like the way you um, dealt with what often I see as a, critici a criticism of MMT there's this sort of tribalism between a job guarantee and MMT and putting to bed that sort of false um, dichotomy has been really useful. But I thought I'd just bring it down to earth with the misery that is Australian politics. Um, and so, for example, I don't often do this, but and I blame Gab for this. She sent me Matt Canavan's tweet that went out this morning. Matt Canavan is a... a um, I'm trying to think of a polite way of saying a right-wing nutjob um, in the government at the moment. And a senator as well. 
and a senator. Yeah, senator. Thank you, Stephen. He's a senator, um, government senator, and a very pro resources, very you know right wing. He put this tweet out. So on the day it was revealed that surging coal exports could add two billion dollars to government revenues, we are promising to spend two billion extra on the doll. They've, they've put in some extra, a tiny amount of extra money into social security. He then says this: if we don't have coal, we can't pay the bills. Um, Stephanie, what's your? You, you're going to comment in the moment. You've got to do a tweet in response to that. Um, uh, what's your response? Well, I mean, that's, he's just wrong, right? I mean, he's missing the fundamental point here that we've just spent the better part of an hour talking about, which is that governments that issue their own currency can always afford to purchase whatever is available and for sale in their own currency. So there is no financial constraint. If you don't have $2 billion coming in uh, from some channel, that doesn't deprive you of the capacity to spend $2 billion. Whatever the government commits, the money will go out. That's the reality of the nature of the system, the way it is set up with the central bank and, uh, and the federal government. So you can commit to the spending and you don't need to rely on the rest of the world to supply you with Australian dollars. You're the issuer of the Australian currency. Um, so. Could I, could I add something? I mean, he's, he's just sure. we're talking about going from $40 a day to $43 a day. To take people back out of poverty, it needs to go to seventy dollars a day. Not only can oh, they yeah, afford yeah. another three dollars a day, yeah, yeah. they can afford another thirty. It's it wouldn't be inflationary, as Stephanie's just explained. There's no problem in funding it, and uh, I don't believe that Matt Canavan actually believes what he's saying here. Hopefully, not getting myself into too much trouble. It's just a political point. And every time we play into this notion that mining billionaires pay for things through their taxes, we actually reinforce the arguments that um, people like Matt Canavan make, even though they're foolish arguments. People just hear them who are only half paying attention to the, to the media and they perhaps don't catch on where he's coming from. He just wants to punish the unemployed. I mean, we have the same conversation here, right? At, at one point, early on in the coronavirus pandemic, the federal government did something truly remarkable, right? They passed the CARES Act, which was then the major piece of legislation, $2.2 trillion uh, spending package that included a top up in unemployment insurance from the federal government on top of what you get at the state level, if you get anything, uh, an additional $600 a week from the federal government, $2,400 a month. That was enough to pull so many people. I mean, the, the research that came after the CARES Act suggests that that, in concert with some of the direct cash payments, helped to prevent 18 people from going into poverty, right? Lift 18 million people out of poverty. So though that kind of cash assistance, income support was a lifeline and then it expired. And then when we came back and we got another package together, the Republicans did this in December with the Democrats. We had a bipartisan bill in December of last year, they cut it in half. So it went to $300 a week. That is going to expire mid-March, so a few weeks from now. So this COVID relief package that President Biden is trying to usher through is uh, includes 400 a week. So we went from 600, cut down to 300. Now we're talking about taking it up to 400. But that number can go. It could be 600 again. It could have been, but they didn't do that. And so what, Stephen? You know, I saw a tweet about this. How this has gone from something fairly generous, whittled down and then up a little and now whittled down again. So yeah, you, you can choose the, the amount of relief that you want to provide to, you know, support um, people in this, in this crisis. You can pick the number. Was there anything else, David? No, look, I, I mean, we've had almost exactly the same debate here about the level of support for, um, uh, uh, we called it Job keeper, so so businesses were given money um, that they could they were meant to but not required to redirect to wages to keep people on the books during the, the recession from the caused by the contraction from COVID, and then job seeker, which was basically an unemployment benefit. 
Um, that job seeker benefit, um, uh, as well as the job keeper benefit, is just about to be pulled from the economy um, in about a month's time. And um, I think we're probably going to see a significant amount of hardship caused at that moment. Um, Stephanie, can you can you give us some analysis about you know a useful way to talk about that? Um, uh, and a useful way to respond to what I think is going to be a, a sort of wave of pain and and, and poverty. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that what the experience was here when we allowed the relief, the income support to expire prematurely, when we didn't stay committed and continue those payments, what happened is we went from pulling 18 million people out of poverty by summer when the income support started to disappear 8 million people fell back into poverty by September. So, you know, that seems to me to be about as good an example as I could offer you in terms of, you know, knowing exactly what the outcome is likely to be. You can pull millions of people out of poverty with the income support. And if you cut it off, they will fall back into poverty. Uh, it, it's just sort of that simple. You know, and it's a choice. It's just a it's just a simple choice. Do you want to extend the income support and keep people whole, or largely, you know, replace lost income and avoid the long term bouts? I mean, we talk a lot here. People like Jerome Powell talk a lot about scarring effects and the longer term damage that's done when you know people become detached from their employers, remain unemployed for long periods of time, become unemployable. And it's much harder to, you know, fully restart the economy and get a robust recovery underway. You've probably like we do, you know, we have this uneven bifurcated sort of recovery. People describe it as a K-shaped recovery. And we don't want a K-shaped recovery. We want that bottom leg lifted up. And we can do that with the kinds of, you know, uh, programs, uh, income support and and the fiscal support, you just have to put it in place and commit to uh, keeping it in place for as long as necessary. The problems are in trying to figure out, you know, which date on the calendar is the right date to cut off the support. And that's what we continue to do with our legislation. And that's why we have to keep coming back again and again. If we could get, you know, better automatic trigger stabilizers in the legislation where the payments continue for as long as the economy remains weak and people need the support. And, you know, then it's a one-off, pass a bill, um, have those income support payments continue and then have them taper off as the labor market shows evidence that, you know, people are returning to work and the support is not necessary. Yeah, I think that task of convincing people that, um, you know, poverty is a political choice, it's just fundamentally a political choice, is, is part of the work we need to do on the left of politics. That's right. um, but it's these, I mean, that, that was a very persuasive macroeconomic assessment, but I would have thought from an equity point of view um, that those, those payments should never be ceased, but, but perhaps put a trigger in them so that as people move into employment, take up a job guarantee, that's when those payments transfer across. Oh, hey, if you're allowing me to put a job guarantee in place, then that's absolutely the trigger. That, that then becomes the program that right sizes the spending, right? As long as the economy is weak and people remain job, well, not jobless, they're employed, but they're not employed in private sector, uh, the program supports them. And as the economy recovers and gains strength and people are hired out of the program, the spending on the program is automatically, um, you know, adjusting to changing economic conditions. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. With a job guarantee in place, you're the the hard the hard work is done. The heavy lifting is mm. now automated. Yeah, that's the policy setting that sort of um, yeah. um, automatically. It's a sort of like a super Keynesian policy yep. setting that that addresses the micro, the macro, and the microeconomic issues. You know, addresses and it addresses the, the dysfunction in the politics where you have to keep waiting for, in our case, Congress or Parliament to come back with another bill and how many weeks are we going to extend this time or months. Uh, it takes all the guesswork out. Thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Thank you very much, David. I just thought 
um, I might uh, quickly, just as a response to David's original um, question, which was about a tweet from our resources man uh, minister, Matt Canavan, um, I also found this on Twitter from Rohan Gray. I, I'm not sure if you've seen this one, but I'll read the tweet out because it, it kind of appeals to me as someone who's in the activist space. Rohan says, it's tempting for the left to lean into the taxpayer money trope because it ostensibly strengthens the argument for redistributive taxation. And then he says, but it's a trap and ultimately leads to one place only, the politics of scarcity, exclusion, xenophobia and white supremacy. He's good. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, Every it's word. Powerful. Yeah. Every word of it. Yeah, because it's an, you're in an austerity frame. What you're mm -hmm. saying when you do what he just said and advise not to do you know, I sometimes said, it, you know, you're in an unless and until world. I'm not going to be able to feed this hungry kid. I'm not going to be able to support this jobless person. I'm not going to be able to do unless and until I'm successful in putting up this new tax or, you know, coming up with the revenue to do that. So you're picking two fights and you got to win both of those fights and you're holding hostage a progressive agenda or even a humane agenda that is held hostage unless you can collect all the votes that are needed to push up the tax, to generate the revenue so that you can pretend that you found the money that allows you to pay for something. And in what happens 99 times out of 100 is that you don't win both fights. You don't get the votes and therefore you don't get the tax revenue and therefore the spending doesn't happen. And that means people just stay in misery, right? And it's gratuitous because you could, you could address problems without, you know, that secondary and unnecessary fight. You can get there in a more direct way, alleviate human suffering in the now. Um, but if you, if you are committed to not addressing problems unless and until you can peel off a few bucks from the billionaire class, then there's a pretty good chance that you're going to be stuck with just, you know, crumbling infrastructure, poverty, homelessness, and all the rest of it. Yeah, and of course, the most marginalised people are the ones who are going to suffer the most from the effects of climate change and austerity. Yep. And they're often, well, they're, they're the people who are also um, from, you know, different, they're immigrants or migrants or uh, traditional owners or um, Indigenous people here in Australia. Already we can see that happening. It's really stark. So I think the racism aspect of it is really important that we acknowledge and work on. Couldn't agree more. There's a bunch of questions that I picked up from earlier on in the session. At least 100 great questions in there and we won't have time for all of them. I'm very sorry. Um, but back a fair way, James asked, what, um, what have you been using as an alternate metaphor to government as household? I mean, I... I just tend to say currency issuer. Uh, I use, in, I never use taxpayer dollars or taxpayer money. I say public money or federal dollars. Yeah. Um, more and more politicians, at least here in the US, are starting to, to do that, to get more careful about the language. You ever notice that the, the phrase taxpayer money is usually invoked when you're trying to um, spotlight something that you don't like? So Democrats will say taxpayer money when they're talking about the Pentagon budget and defense spending. Ah, oh, the taxpayer money, because that right, gets you, right? Uh, Republicans say taxpayer money when they're talking about, you know, welfare programs or something like that. Oh, taxpayers are supporting these welfare programs. But um, no, you just, it's our money. It's our money. It's public money. And the government is where it comes from. You know, I use the power of the purse. So I say uh, government has the power of the purse. That's what makes them unlike a household. They have the power of the purse. I think I read in your book as well that you use the metaphor of like um, a, a football match or, you know, where the one team is scoring points. And um, will, you know, will the referee run out of points? No. If a team keeps scoring points, they just keep adding points to the score. Yeah, yeah, we sometimes use the phrase, the government is the scorekeeper for the dollar. So, you know, that does drive home the point that the point that it really is about, you know, it, you just think of the government as standing on the outside of some giant Excel spreadsheet 
where all of us are a cell, you know, there are columns and all of our names are there and they can click a button and the numbers in our cell can go up. If they spend uh, dollars into our account and the numbers can go down if they tax dollars out of our account, but they're sort of standing on the outside as they have this unique capacity that the rest of us don't have to change the numbers up and down. So the scorekeeper. Aussies will get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's another question about um, ha- what are some good ways that people, like the people here on this call, for example, what are some ways that we can start getting the message out? What are some ways that have been effective for people that you know of? I know one way that's effective. You've done it. Have Stephanie Kelton here for about 10 days. <laughs> we were all over the media. Yeah, have Stephen Hale. Uh- organize a calendar of events for you and fill it up for 10 days and always come back to, can we do one more? Can I just add one more thing? Um, No, I mean, you know, we have now after all these years, we do have a deep bench. In the early years, there were a smaller number of economists who were trying to put these ideas out. And I mean, after a quarter of a century, there, the ranks have grown, and it's not just economists anymore. You have legal scholars and historians, and um, you know, philosophers. There, there are, all, and that's just in academia. And then you have, you know, journalists who have, you know, come very much on board and are sympathetic, and that's powerful when people in, you know, posi- with positions of influence and a megaphone um, can also start improving the discourse just in the way that they conduct interviews and the things that they talk about and the way they talk. And then there are, you know, activists and, um, and thought leaders and other, like there's just this huge community now and it's everyone doing their, what, you know, contributing in their own ways that's created that tailwind that's, I think, really brought us in the last couple of years so much. The ball has moved so far down the field because of, you know, the efforts of so many different people, people in the UK with podcasts. I mean, I can't imagine the work that people do curating Mm -hmm. articles and maintaining websites where you can go to get, uh, you know, a collection, like Stephen said, get in touch with me and I'll send you all the MMT scholarship. Well, there are people out there who, you know, work very hard to maintain a library of resources to make these things available. So, you, you can help in ways big and small, you know. It's one, one of the small but hopefully um, helpful ways that, that we, things that we'll be doing here in Adelaide this year, our volunteers, who many of you who, who you met when you came over for our conference, uh, we are training to deliver short talks on MMT to public, to the public. So we're going to be going around to like local rotary groups and um, University of the Third Age, wherever we can get a speaking gig, public radio, we're going to train up a bunch of people and start. We've got slides prepared. You can even that's awesome from our website that's if you want. Awesome. So, <laughs> you know, I've, I've been in touch with someone who reached out to me four or five months ago and he went through a program. This was, you know, kind of in a way, well, it's like what you're describing. He did it because Al Gore organized something. And Al Gore said, we need the population to understand that humans are contributing to global warming, that that climate change is, you know, a result of you know, actions that we take, right? Human uh, action. And so he brought together, I think, thousands of people and trained them and in a sense kind of certified them and then sent them off to become, you know, uh, messengers in in this effort to, to shape and change the public's understanding of what was happening. And it sounds a lot like what you're describing. You know, a couple of days ago, I got an email from, uh, a woman that I have, I, I met years ago and she sent me an email and she had a photograph and she was asking if I would give her permission to use the picture 
in um, an advertising that she was going to do about public talks that she, so here I am in the picture with this gal and this guy from who knows how many years ago, but she's going out in her community and giving talks on MMT. And she wanted to know if it would be okay to use the picture. I said, of course, you know, go for it and good luck. And I, I'm sure it's going to be great, but people are, you know, amazing what people are out there doing quietly and behind the scenes and and publicly people are pouring in a lot of their energy to try to you know be part of getting us to a better place um it's amazing absolutely and i think we can all help each other to communicate well and to communicate with compassion and kindness, even to people that we don't agree with. And that's how we win the argument. Yeah, that's such a good, I'm glad you said that because, you know, you could get very impassioned and it is often frustrating to hear people, you know, espousing these myths, but everybody hasn't arrived. I once didn't know, you know, I didn't always have this understanding of things. So I was once as confused and probably worried about deficits as anybody else. So take a sympathetic approach and meet people where they are and, and try to help bring them along. Yeah. Yeah. Just on, on, on that, um, there was a couple of questions about um, the, the messaging around owing as Australia owing money to foreign countries like China in particular. And I think that does play into people's fears a bit. Um, Do you have any? Do you want me to? Yeah, go, Steve. The first thing I can say is that um, the first thing I can say is that the Australian Commonwealth Government has no significant foreign currency debt at all. Um, when I the government, I, I I interpreted her to maybe I'm wrong, but I thought that it's the same thing we hear here, right? That China holds lots of treasuries. So we're in debt to China, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, and, and of course we don't stop foreign investors buying treasury bonds on the secondary market. Uh, the government spends more than it raises in taxes for reasons that Stephanie was mentioning before in, in support of uh, interest rate policy. They've uh, auctioned treasury bonds down the years and then anybody can buy treasury bonds secondhand and Australia's currency has been one of the world's major reserve currencies. It's the fifth or sixth most heavily held currency for a long time. And if foreign investors want to hold Australian dollars and they want a safe asset, they're going to buy treasury bonds. Although they don't own as many of them as they used to as a proportion of the total because the RBA has been buying up so much recently. And if people are worried about Australia, they shouldn't be anyway, but if people were worried about Australia as a whole, borrowing from the rest of the world, the news is at the moment... Not that this is important, but we have a current account surplus, so we're not borrowing from the rest of the world in any sense at the moment. I have I have another question here from Rena. So we might just do that one and then I'll try and bring Tammy Franks in. So Rena asks, what does MMT have to say about sustainable economies? And I think uh, she's referring to the need for degrowth. Well, Lots, um, not lots in my book, but when I talk about the limits, I do have in the book the recognition that the limits are not just uh, inflation, but also there are ecological limits, right? The So much of the obsession with growth, right, with getting high rates of growth and generating positive economic growth and so forth, so much of that obsession, I think, is bound up in our obsession with debt. So for too many years, economists told us that the thing you have to watch out for is the debt to GDP ratio, the debt in the numerator, the GDP in the denominator. And we had the whole, you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff, very influential, you know, Harvard economists telling us there are these tipping points out there and you got to keep your eye on the debt to GDP ratio. And if it exceeds this threshold of 90% or whatever, then you, you tip over and bad things start happening, right? So, people become obsessed with GDP growth because it's in the denominator. And if the ratio is the thing that matters, it isn't. 
if the ratio is the thing that matters, then you can grow your way out of the problem by rapidly increasing your GDP growth so that the ratio comes down, you see? So MMT helps us to get over the obsession with debt to help us shift our thinking, how we understand the debt so that we don't have to obsess over growing our way out of debt. You can actually then uh, accommodate thinking about degrowth or, you know, those sort of things. So that's the way I think about it. I love, you know, I um, think that my book pairs really nicely with the work of someone like Kate Raworth, the donut uh, economy. And, um, and so that's so compatible. If you marry the main insights of the two, of MMT and of where she's coming from, then you can get to a place, and even Mariana Mazzucato, you can get mission-oriented um, public spending to keep you in the safe part of the donut and understand how to pay for it. So the three, I think, can work really well together and put you in that um, sustainability, not just dealing with the fiscal sustainability, but but ecological and environmental. I'm not sure if Tammy's uh, still on the call. I did uh, send her a message, but oh, here she is. Hi, Tammy. Hi. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for again, another amazing um, narrative and, and talk. Every time I, I hear you, I, I feel like I'm a little bit more empowered as a politician uh, to start taking on some of these uh, arguments, if you like, or debates. Um, the narrative that you've mentioned, and, and this was going to be my question, Gabby, so it, it kind of got co covered. I mean, the narrative is so strong that you have to have either or. We're always told in politics it's always a choice, um, and that choice is always by default somebody misses out. Um, I like the idea of, you know, the football game and um, there's no limit uh, there on the score but what I find is that um, that's not the story that we're fed as in in the political narrative as a budget is delivered we've got the the prime minister with his back in black cup and mm. it's all about the numbers and the black versus the red and a uh, the markers of the success of a politician and Paul Keating did this very successfully uh, being able to have that surplus. Now, how do we get media to understand that that's not actually how they should be giving people the, you know, the high score, if you like, in terms of how politicians perform? Because at the moment, that is actually how journalists have their prism, their lens. Um, how do we get to them? Look, it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend there's some silver bullet, but you can put your budget in balance or achieve a surplus by destroying your economy. Greece achieved a primary budget surplus, but at the cost of mass austerity that wrecked the Greek economy and destroyed livelihoods and created massive suffering and so forth. So, you know, the idea that we're going to measure our success in terms of governing and so forth by where the budget the number that falls out of the budget box at the end of every year. It's not the way to go. And GDP growth is not the right metric either. So you've got a, an Australian economist there uh, who's asking us to replace the you know GDP as the measure of well-being with something more meaningful. And he calls it a genuine progress indicator. Pay attention to the GPI, right, Phil says. He's watching uh, at the moment, actually. Hi, Phil. <laughs> So, you know, but how do you get the press to start highlighting and shining a spotlight? You, what you ideally want, I think, is for the government to budget Australia's real resources. Say, these are the real, these are the things that matter. In my book, I have a chapter called The Deficits That Matter. Shift the focus. You know, I will never go on TV and I will go on Fox and CNBC and so forth. I will never let anyone put me in a position where I have to concede a, a faulty premise. So if somebody says to me, well, how are we going to deal with the debt problem? What are we going to do about the deficit? I never say, 
well, if we if we grow the economy, we can bring down the debt to GDP. I never concede a false premise. And that's the problem that too many left and uh, progressive economists even make is reinforcing those bad frames. Flip the script on them. And, you know, we can do our part by centering the deficits that matter. Say, you know, let's talk, you want to talk about deficits? Let's talk about the deficit in healthcare or education or housing or, you know, poverty. Let's, you, let's talk about those deficits, right? Because, well, anyway, I could go on and on, but it, it, one person can't re- reframe the political narrative. It takes lots of people. And we've been helped out a lot, not enough, but a lot by journalists, who over the years have realized that they ask the wrong questions. If you get a senator to come on your show, your radio show, your podcast, your TV show, and you sit down and you say, how are you going to pay for that? You're part of the problem. So a number of journalists have become part of the solution and they don't ask those questions. So, so often it's what you don't say that matters as much as anything else, you know, and it's just, it, it's going to take us a lot of time and they have the weaponry and they use it. The media is weaponized. The deficit is weaponized. And the idea that surplus equals good and maybe the last guy that you admired and respected and revered and he delivered a surplus and I can invoke his name and we do it with Bill Clinton here. Democrats will say, uh, well, Bill Clinton, boy, he was the one, right? Because he put the budget in surplus. And so we Democrats, we are the party you should vote for because we're the only ones that actually balance the budget in the last 40 years. Uh, we have to get away from that. So we're just on uh, 1 p.m. Adelaide time. Um, and we did say 90 minutes. There's so many questions that we haven't got to and I apologize. Save the questions and I will at some point do my best as a sort of poor, poor person's Stephanie Kelton impersonator. I'll do my best to write answers to all the questions and we'll put them up on our website. I will get to every question eventually. That is very generous of you, Stephen. In the meantime, if you would like to um, stay in touch with uh, the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group, you can sign up to our mailing list if you're not already on it. I don't send mail very often, so you won't get a lot of spam. But that's our website, and you can read about what we're doing here in Adelaide. Um, And for Adelaide people, we're running a two-day summer school called Summer School in April, Rethinking Capitalism. It's about the deficit myth, um, the uh, ecological economics and the donut model, and much more besides. We do Kelton, Raworth and Mazzucato all in one weekend. Yep, and it is... Uh, the weekend after Easter here in here in Adelaide at the University of Adelaide. So send me a message if you'd like more info on that. And I think, Stephanie, um, we will probably wrap it up there because we don't want to keep you any longer than we need to. Um, but thank you so, so much for being with us today and, like, really, really appreciate your time. You do such great work and you're so busy and, you know, this is probably the fifth talk you've done today, <laughs> fifth or sixth, I reckon. Um, But, yeah, it's just been great to see your face live and it's a great pleasure um, for us to be able to benefit from your wisdom. Well, thank you both. I mean, I I adore you both. I am so grateful to both of you. Everything you do, you know that if you ask me to do something, I'm always going to say yes. So That's um, why we don't ask you too often. (laughs) You'll ask me again and I will say yes again. So thank you. To invite you to come to Adelaide again. That would be amazing. Yes. Yeah. We look forward to that. that. I do too. Thanks for for everybody for uh, participating as well. Yeah. Thank you to everyone. All right. I think I will close the meeting on that note. Thank you. And three cheers for Stephanie. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, 
and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.